Welcome to Teaching Artist Podcast, a show dedicated to discussions of teaching art to kids, making art, and how those things overlap and feed each other. I'm Rebecca Potts, your host, a visual arts teaching artist. What a busy week. Somehow December always flies by and I cannot believe it is almost the end of the year. We have had a lot going on in addition to wrapping up this semester of teaching, trying to prepare for some spring art exhibits, and continuing to ride the pandemic parenting wave we are wrapping up our first open call. I am so excited about our winter juried exhibition coordinated in collaboration with Maria Coit of Curated for Kids and juried by the wonderful artist and educator Chloe Alexander. Submissions are closing Sunday evening, December 13th. It is such an honor and a joy to be on this side of things and see such incredible work come in. I'm so often submitting my work, so it's really interesting to be on the other side of things. With that in mind, I will be sharing soon on Instagram Live a few tips for submissions. So make sure that you're following us at Teaching Artist Podcast on Instagram. We will also be sending feedback to all artists who submitted work to the show. We are so excited to open the show in mid-January after Chloe has made selections and we've had some time to set it all up. Thank you if you have submitted. We love seeing your work come in. Lauren Mercerone shared her struggles with dyslexia and how she's learned to embrace her unique challenges and value her unique strengths. I loved how she talked about making art to feed her soul and thinking of showing and selling it as secondary. It's so easy to get bogged down in the business and admin side of art, so that was a really good reminder. Just the other day, I realized that I had spent over two hours just looking at open calls, potential opportunities, and peers one evening instead of using that precious little solo time for art making. Like that's the only focus time I have. Now, if you are serious about an art career, of course, those admin and business tasks are necessary. But I found that it really helps to be more strategic about time. So I try really hard to use that solo focus time in the studio for things that I really want to be able to focus on. I feel like I can do some of that admin stuff while I'm with my daughter or kind of in between all the other things going on in life. Whew. But Lauren had such inspiring words. Lauren Mercerone is an elementary art teacher and artist based outside Atlanta, Georgia. She celebrates her language processing disorders because this unique wiring helps her visualize information stronger than imaginable. Feeling with lines, touching with color, bringing all the shapes together. Her art advocates for people who suffer from dyslexia. She says, for so long, I felt stupid. I tried to overcompensate, suppress my feelings, and pretend that I was normal. Children that suffer from language processing disorders should never feel this way. Through my work, I communicate the unique messages of the dyslexic brain. My work is a form of meditation that helps to quiet the noise in my mind. The constant push and pull between right and left brain the battle between conforming and being free. Oh, so powerful. Let's dive into this conversation. I am here with Lauren Merceron, and I am very excited to hear about your teaching experience and your story as an artist. And I always start with that kind of background. How did you get into teaching? And then also, how did you become an artist? And, you know, did one come first? 
I think it all kind of happened very organically. My mother is a first grade teacher and she advised me to try to think of anything else to be. Can you think of anything Um. else? And, you know, I... It was interesting because I, well, from from day one in school, even before elementary school, I always just wanted to make things with my hands, anything I could try to create or any way to express myself visually. It just, that was my natural way of communicating Mm -hmm. and growing up and seeing her passion for education and also being very inspired by the art teachers that I had during school. I just kind of always knew that that's what I wanted to do. And the only bad thing is that I didn't listen to myself (laughs) in the beginning. So I kind of had a long path to get to where I am. I started out in college. I graduated undergrad from Appalachian State in North Carolina, and I went to school for interior design. And when Mm. I graduated, that was right when we had that big recession. So two years after in 2010. So I tried to work in that field doing some internships. I applied for many jobs and it just wasn't panning out. And I believe that was the universe's way of saying this is not right for you. So I did a lot of soul searching, I guess you would say, in my 20s. And that has really informed, I think, what I'm doing now. So I I just went out on a whim and I called my university and I said, there's so many volunteering opportunities to travel and volunteer and see the world, but I can't afford any of them. Is there any Mm -hmm. way that I can do something like this to try to discover and try to learn more about my inner self to get on the right path. And they brought Mm -hmm. up this program called Wolfing, and it stands for Worldwide Organization of Organic Farming. Yeah. And so I went off for about six months. I um, worked in some different vineyards in Italy Mm -hmm. and stayed there And basically just picked weeds and picked (laughs) weeds in their, in their gardens and worked in the cantina bottling wine and just had a lot of time to just be with myself and learn how to be comfortable with myself because there, there were really a lot of different things that I, I hadn't been diagnosed at the time, but I knew that there was some struggles that I had that I was always overcoming. And Mm. that was that I was severely dyslexic, Mm. but I was able to kind of work through that and become very resilient But I never wanted anyone to know. I was always trying to hide myself and try to look somewhat normal to the outside world. Mm. Yeah, so I just, I went off and just tried to learn how to be comfortable and just learn to be proud of the way I was uniquely designed and to learn how to celebrate those things. So after that six months of having a lot of time to be in my head, that sounds dangerous, but it actually, it really, it really worked out for me to just have, you know, to be out of my element and in such a beautiful place. Then I came home and actually got very, very depressed. Mm -hmm. And it was an outward, you know, it's like I came off of a high and I was like, okay, now I'm back. I don't want to be back. I was basically just trying to run away from the reality that school was over I've graduated from college. I don't know what's next. And lots of yeah. people are like that. So I I started Googling things. <laughs> and I found a program to teach abroad and teach English abroad. And I know many people are familiar with this. So I, I got the certification 
for ESOL mm-hmm. and taught abroad for about a year and a half in uh, mm-hmm. South Korea. And when I came back, That was when I decided, okay, I'm going to go to grad school. I know that art is is like my safe haven. That's where I can really shine. That is where I want to be. That's what I want to be teaching because really you can learn anything through art. So I enrolled in graduate school. Oh, let me rewind. I (laughs) forgot a key piece. So I came back from South Korea and I was actually filling out the paperwork to go back, Mm -hmm. trying to run again. So I'm a runner. Mm -hmm. I was trying to run again because I was back to reality and still not quite sure, kind of scared to take the next steps. And so I filled out the paperwork and then all of a sudden I meet this guy. (laughs) He is now my husband, Tyler Mercuron. And he said, you know, after so many long conversations with him in our kind of honeymoon phase, when we're just getting to know each other, he says, please don't take this the wrong way, but you're running. You, you're you running. You have to stop running and you have to face face things and you have to get on with your life. And mm-hmm. it's apparent that you want to teach and you love art. So get in grad school. It's not that hard. Just go. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and really it wasn't. And then he told me another, another thing that felt very uncomfortable comfortable, but I'm so glad that he helped me through this. It, he said, you know, I, I see a lot of similarities in you that I see in my mother. And I said, okay, elaborate. What do you mean by that? And he said, well, you know, you transpose things or you say, th- you take different words and you make them into one word or you say things backwards. And, you know, it's just really interesting. And he he was like, have you ever been tested for dyslexia? And I said, no, I just honestly, I, I've i kind of thought that I just wasn't quite sure. I knew that I was heightened in organizing things and putting things together. And I've always been a very visual, like big picture person, not a small details person. Mm-hmm. And I ended up taking the test and they found out that I had a language processing disorder. But the thing is, what was even the good of me knowing that? I don't know because it stigmatized me for quite some time. Mm -hmm. But I think the issue that was able to be resolved is that, yes, I do have this label and I hate labels, Mm -hmm. but before I always wanted to hide who I was. And now I say, you know, I don't really like reading out loud to people. I am not a good speller, but these are my strong points and these are ways that I can add to our group and, you know, and just learning how to celebrate the things that I'm good at and just accept my weaknesses and continue to work on them. Yeah. Did having the diagnosis give you also accommodations in grad school? Like that could be one reason getting that label might be helpful. Yes. So they gave me accommodations and Mm -hmm. the one thing that has really changed my life so much is dictation Mm -hmm. because I think I would just get so frustrated with dyslexia that I have all this stuff in my brain and I cannot get it out. It's all there and I want to communicate it through my writing. It was really the weaknesses in my writing. It's not in my thoughts or the way I organize them. It is in the actual mm-hmm. the actual writing of it. So when I started to use dictation, it was revolutionary. I I mean, I could write a five page paper in one hour, just get it all out and then go back in and regroup, read over it, revise it. It was just like, I felt like, 
oh my gosh, life is just, it's not that hard. Thank goodness. Because before it's just like, Every task with writing was overwhelming. It was agonizing because everything would be in my mind. And then while I'm trying to write one thought down, I lose all the rest of it. It's like my brain Mm -hmm. is working faster than I can capture it, (laughs) if that makes sense. Yeah. And is there like a specific software that you use or is it just the Google free dictation stuff? I have searched. Yeah, it's all the free. Yeah. I I think I have searched to see. At first, I, I bought a Mac and I noticed that there is a dictation feature on the Mac mm. that's free and they have, you know, I'm sure if you pay for one, they're even better. But then even with mm-hmm. reading, so like I'm also like, it takes me a long time to read information and digest it. Mm-hmm. And so I use, I love Audible because I can also listen to books and learn while I'm painting or while I'm doing other things because also, mm-hmm. you know, teaching artists And also being a mother, it's like you just have to really maximize your time. Like you can't just sit on the couch for hours and read. You need to Mm -hmm. read and paint and cook and all of those (laughs) things all at the same time and lesson plan. So like sometimes, now I probably should not be saying this out loud, but sometimes (laughs) when I'm lesson planning, I'm always thinking of plans and how can I do this better, but I may even be driving down the road and just record myself talking to capture those Mm -hmm. ideas and then go back and then formally put it in a plan. But I've noticed that when I was about 27, I noticed that once I started giving myself grace about my weaknesses Mm -hmm. and letting people know up front that, you know, I am dyslexic, but I can function just like anyone else. Just give me a chance. And there's also things that I can see more clearly because of the deficit in one area, there are heightened things in other areas. Mm -hmm. And people have been so gracious to accept this. And it's really just opened me up to so many opportunities before, you know, I was hiding. I was hiding. I didn't want anyone to know that I was stupid, you Mm. know, and then I learned that I'm actually brilliant in some areas. And the thing is, I tell my students this all the time. The art room was my refuge. In high school, I Mm -hmm. thought, oh my gosh, please, please don't call on me to read. Please don't. Please, please. Mm -hmm. Because I got picked on so much. People laughed at me and, you know, it just really stigmatized me. But then I knew at one o'clock I was going to my heavenly place and that was the art room. And I knew that there, no one could touch me there, that that was my safe place Mm -hmm. and that I could, it was a meditative place where I could just focus on the things that brought happiness and there was no struggles. There were no struggles there. Yeah, that's beautiful. Do you feel like having those experiences helps you to kind of help students through similar experiences? Absolutely, because we all need small wins, Mm -hmm. no matter what. And the school that I work at right outside of Atlanta We are a Title I school, 100% free and reduced lunch, and the kids are so resilient. I cannot explain to you how resilient they are, how much that they have had to endure in their life. I don't even know. And, you, you know, they just come so happy, and they're smiling, and they're ready, and they're eager. And God only knows what they went through the night before. Did they sleep? Did they have a bed to sleep in? I don't know. But what I do know is that we love each other. Mm. I've been at this school for four years now. 
And uh, the first year, it was a very challenging year. They tested me very, very much. But then once I came back, The next year, year two after the summer, so many of those kids said, oh my gosh, Miss Merceron, you you came back? (laughs) They couldn't believe that I came back. Like, you came back for us to beat you up more? And, and then it's like, then I earned my badge of honor for, with them because they knew that I was in their life to stay. And if they were there for six years and I was going to be there with them and we were going to grow together, Mm -hmm. that's the beauty of teaching elementary because you get to be with these kids for six years and you get to watch them grow Mm -hmm. and they just, they could I couldn't believe that I came back. And then after that, it got so much easier because it's like they know that I'm not trying to be perfect and they know that Mm -hmm. I'm not on a pedestal and they know that we're different, but we're also the same. Mm -hmm. Like I'm one of only a handful of Caucasian teachers in my school. It's mostly African-American and Hispanic. And, you know, at first there was a lot of pushback there because, you know, I'm different. And why is she trying to come to this school? Is she trying to come and save us? What is her deal? You know, and once they saw that art is about celebrating our differences, I feel like we're always drawn to the things that are different than us. Mm -hmm. We always want to learn about people that have done things in a different way. That's just our natural curiosity as artists. So, and just being honest with the kids and telling them, you know, I'm not perfect. I have struggles. We all have struggles. But in here, we're going to practice learning how to fail and how to learn from our failures and move forward. Yeah, I like that point about artists kind of just looking at the world and and embracing all of the different things that we see. Yeah, I guess it's all in how you look at it. Like I follow a lot of African-American artists and Mm -hmm. I learn from them daily. Here we were interrupted by the loudspeaker at Lauren's school. She was recording with me during her lunch break. Yeah, I guess, you know, when you look at the art world, I mean, that's a whole different situation. I may never be Mm -hmm. a part of the art world, whatever that (laughs) means. But as an artist, I feel like Mm -hmm. our eyes are different. Mm -hmm. We see things differently. And it's our job to teach people that there's no right or wrong way to look at things like we we can show people where to look but we shouldn't try to teach them what to see Mm. I don't know if that made sense or not yeah I like that analogy and I feel like along those lines like you mentioned that you are following and looking at a lot of black artists are there any that you also bring into the classroom and that you share with students Absolutely. We last year, Cyrus C Y R U S, and his last name is K A B I R U, Cyrus Kabiru. We did a project where we looked at Cyrus Kabiru's work. He was also featured at the High Museum of Art. And we have a part, a portion in our curriculum for sculptural art. And what he does with his work is he upcycles things that he finds, Mm -hmm. materials that he finds, and he turns them into these optical, like almost like lenses that you Mm -hmm. wear. So it's almost kind of like high fashion, but he uses junk 
to create it and to turn it into something really beautiful. Mm. So the kids, they really related to learning about his work. But yes, I really try to make sure that we're not talking about old white guys in our art room. Yeah, yeah, I think that's important, especially, well, for all students. Mm-hmm. We also try to focus on women artists, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like that's really important as well. I don't know what your experience was as a kid, but I know for me, like, I I don't think I knew any female artists until maybe high school when I was introduced to Georgia Mm O'Keeffe. And I loved her and I still love her. But I'm like, you know, do you know how many other (laughs) women there are that are making art? So just like, yeah, and... I mean, I feel like it sort of subconsciously gave me the idea that it was like, you know, there's not very many women that can do this. Like, it's going to be hard if you pursue this. So just giving students the idea that there are people that look just like you that do this. So if you have the desire to be an artist, you can completely do that. That's something that's normal for someone who is, you know, a woman or is black or is, you know, Latino, whatever, like whatever you look like, there are artists that also look like you. That's right. And I kind of, I wanted to go back to the whole dyslexia topic Mm -hmm. because the thing that my husband, he, he really encouraged me so much. He said, Lauren, you know, you don't need to look at this as a deficit. You need to look at this as something that sets you apart Mm -hmm. and something that can elevate you. Do you know how many successful people have this learning disability? His mother, Odette Bellano, she is one of the head CEO for hospital systems. And there's mm-hmm. so many people, so many actors, so many like business women and men that have been able to use this to elevate themselves. So when I, you know, when I made that mindset shift, it really was a good step in the right direction. And also for my kids in the classroom, you know, just you have to think about, I can't, if they say, I can't do that, I can't do that. And then you just, all you need to do is say, you can't do that yet. Mm -hmm. that word yet once you add that it opens you up it opens your mind up to so many other possibilities and really you just can't imagine where you can go from there when you just add the word yet yeah when you open your mind and are not Mm closed-minded yeah absolutely Hey listeners, I'm jumping in here because I have an ask of you. If you are enjoying the show, I would so appreciate your support. I'm humbled and grateful for all the interest in this show over the past several months and for the messages I've received letting me know that this podcast has resonated with you. It has been so inspiring to hear from you. Thank you. This podcast does take time, effort, and resources to share with you every week. And I want to, I plan to, keep it going and stay focused on highlighting and inspiring artists who teach while also continuing to grow this community and dreaming up additional ways to help you. One way to accomplish this is through direct listener support. Your support would really help the show and community grow. So I've set up a link where you can quickly and easily support the show. The whole thing will take less than 60 seconds. It's at anchor.fm slash teachingartistpodcast slash support. You can contribute one, five, or ten dollars per month. If Teaching Artist Podcast is a part of your week and you love what we're doing, please consider visiting anchor.fm slash teaching artist podcast slash support, or just clicking the link in the show notes and supporting us in any way that you can today. 
Well, I would love to hear more about your artwork and if you could maybe describe your work for somebody who hasn't seen it. My most recent work is about mothering. Mm -hmm. I am a new mother and I have been just, there's, it sounds weird, but one of the most beautiful things, like one of my most favorite times is bath time. Mm. And I, you know, when I, when Grayson was a newborn and still we a lot of times take showers and I, I would put his little seat in the shower and just let the water fall on his head. And so this simple act of cleansing and sharing that time together, mm-hmm. and I would kind of just observe this time, like, because there's a big mirror that's right in front of the shower. And it's like, I just, want to capture this. I want to, I want to always remember this feeling of these special moments with the water hitting on his head and how that felt. So I would take photographs and try to turn those moments into abstractions. Mm. So basically from the photograph, I would do like an exercise, like a loose sketch where I'm just making lots of little circles like almost, it's almost just like abstract figure drawings Mm -hmm. and the work has lots of layers in it. It's a lot of mother and child, like just, you know, you're embracing the child, holding your, Mm -hmm. holding your child and lots of monochromatic colors of blue. Mm -hmm. I've always gravitated towards the color blue and That's a symbol for me of peace and Mm. clarity and uh, what is the word? Uh, Just like thinking of water and Mm. thinking about cleansing and things like that. So Mm. the work is very, it's like you don't even see the any features of the face. It's very abstract. But I found that I am more drawn to creating this way because then I look at it and I say, oh, this is an abstraction of this memory. And I, I since then, I've kind of thumbed through some old photographs. Like, uh, there's one photograph that I remember of my mother and my sister a day that we went to pick apples and went hiking. Mm-hmm. And I just, I love love that picture. And you probably as a viewer would never know it, but I know it. I know that I took that photograph and I abstracted it into a portrait of our trio. We, you know, Mm -hmm. we're like the three amigos. (laughs) We hang tight together, mother, sister, and I. And every time I look at that painting, it reminds me of just the strength that we represent. Yeah, that's beautiful. I'm looking at them now. I love how the abstraction also makes it almost like more universal. Like you look at it and you see the story and the moment that you were picturing when you or like even looking at the photo when you created it. But I can look at it and picture like a moment I had with my child or with, you know, friends or my family with the three, the three people. So it becomes like almost more universal that way. Yes. And I was thinking if I never get in a gallery or if no one ever buys my work, I'm, I'm okay because I, we do this work because it feeds our soul. Mm -hmm. And if someone, if someone enjoys looking at it or wants to have it in their home, that will be the best feeling ever. But that's not what drives me to create. And I went through a dry spell where I just, I I was doing a lot of negative self-talk and Mm -hmm. saying to myself, you know, like I I don't even feel comfortable to call myself an artist, blah, 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 blah. And I joined a group of artists and uh, it's called Ben's has a Uh podcast as well, the uh, Dear Artists podcast. Yeah. 
And she has helped me so much because she says, you know, who cares? Like you have to go through, you have to make a lot of crap Mm -hmm. before you get to the beautiful work. And, you know, we sometimes we're afraid to get started because we don't want to go through the pain of what it feels like to make that crap. Yeah. But then the more, the more crap that you make, (laughs) the closer you get to the beautiful things. And I feel like creativity never runs dry. It's like the more you, the more you use it, the more you have, Mm -hmm. the more you exercise those muscles, the more that spills out of you, which Mm -hmm. is so, that's what's so great about it. But yeah, as far as my art, like I, I would love for someone to call me and say, you know, can you take these pictures of my family? And if I, you know, if I write a little story for you and explain who we are and what it kind of feels like in our home, like our, there, we always have Frank Sinatra blaring mm-hmm. and we're always dancing around and my husband's always spilling his coffee and just mm-hmm. kind of take all of these feelings and turn it into this abstraction, Mm. then it kind of creates a narrative. Like if you have that in your home and people come over and they're curious, like, what is this? Oh, and then you could just say, this is us. Mm -hmm. This is what it feels like in our home, like on a a no lipstick, no like floocy dress kind of day, like the real down and dirty us. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And having it be like, I like what you said about the work feeding your soul. And yeah, the Dear Artists project, I know I've I've heard about that project and I know of Ben's Amataya. She seems amazing. I'll need to like connect with her at some point. She is. She gave me a, an assignment oh. <laughs> and I, my assignment was to paint 30 mother and child paintings Ooh. and don't think, do not think, just let mm-hmm. it come out however it wants to come out and don't overthink it. Just make, make, make every day. Even when you don't feel like exercising those muscles, just get the pain out. Even if it's just a few marks, just get it done. And what I found, and if you try this, what you'll find is that Mm -hmm. the hardest part is getting started. And then the more I have been doing, you know, every day creating, it's like the more I am, I have an appetite to, I I have to make that time. Mm -hmm. Like my son is, 18 months. And so it's very hard. But Lisa Condon, Mm -hmm. do you know? Yeah. She says, even if it's in the margins of your day, just do it. Like if you have five minutes here, get your sketchbook out and just scribble. If you don't know what to do, just make some marks. Like Mm -hmm. just do something until the good stuff comes and don't expect anything good. Don't look for anything good good. Like it will eventually come. You just be patient and show up every day and work. Yeah. And that's advice I hear again and again to just, you know, if you stick to it and commit and like keep showing up, eventually the good things will happen. You will get good work out of yourself and it will start to take off, but it it requires that commitment, which uh, I know is so hard to like carve out those little moments when you're in early motherhood and teaching and like juggling so much. So I definitely feel you there. And I I love that just like, you know, even if you have five minutes, 10 minutes, just do something. That's great advice. So I know you mentioned kind of being not sure about working with galleries or any of that. Have you tried to like show your work or sell your work? And if so, what, how are you like seeking out opportunities? Well, 
I had some good success over Mother's Day. Like before Mother's Day, I posted some works and I just posted them in my stories Mm -hmm. and just said that, you know, the works are priced at this amount. X amount is going to go to our community food bank. Mm -hmm. So I donated money that I made to the food bank and I had quite a few sales from that. Mm -hmm. As far as gallery representation, I have one gallery that is interested and I just need to push myself out there because she says, you know, just get a bot like she loves the mother and child pieces Mm -hmm. and just try to get maybe, I don't know, she didn't, I really was happy she didn't give any limitations or anything because a lot of times, you know, galleries want certain things and then it kind then you go down this slippery slope about like, are you making your work for yourself? Are you making mm-hmm. it for other people? Mm-hmm. So getting a body of work together and bringing it to this gallery, it's in Gainesville, Georgia, mm-hmm. but I just, I've been working and working and I'm not quite where I want to be with that work, mm-hmm. but then then again, it's just like, am I being my own worst critic? Should I just take it and see what she says? I don't know. Yeah, it's so hard to make those decisions and kind of figure out like, where do you want to go? Do you want to work with a gallery or not? Yeah. I really would love to have some gallery representation because Mm -hmm. the idea of self-promotion for me, it just makes me cringe. Mm -hmm. I do what I do because I love it and I'm happy to share it, but the whole idea of I'm going to be releasing things in my shop Mm -hmm. on this day and get ready and join the mailing list and blah, blah, blah. It just does not. And I know it's probably not natural for anyone. You just have to push yourself outside your comfort zone. But I just I just feel sick to my stomach about the idea of Mm self-promotion and it just, I, it just doesn't come natural at all to me. Yeah. I feel the same way. That's something I totally struggle with. And I'm just like, I have no idea what I'm doing when it comes to trying to sell my own work. Yes. Yeah. Definitely feel you there. That's another thing that Ben's always says, just make it for yourself and keep sharing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, throw some hashtags in there. Who cares? <laughs> just just keep every day, make something every day and, and share what you're doing. And mm-hmm. also when you think about it, like the work is inside of you. Mm-hmm. You're just you're just the the vessel or the tool that is allowing it to come out. Mm -hmm. So when you think about it like that, yes, it's my work. Yes, it's my story. But sometimes things come out and I'm like, where did that come from? Or I could start with something and then the end result is so much different or it's Mm -hmm. evolved so much from what I originally had planned to do that I'm like, wow, I really am just the tool that this is coming, like spilling out of. It's very intuitive. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that I need to learn is how to listen and how to stop and how to know when not to overwork something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really tough. Yeah, especially I feel like with like your sort of abstraction, part of the beauty of it is these sort of like loose gestural like movement in in the work. And it makes it like it feels like you have to kind of start with that. And then the rest of the painting is just working really hard not to lose that. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Yeah, that's definitely a tricky, tricky thing. And by no means have I I think I will probably be 90 years old and maybe still in the same position (laughs) that I'm in. But the thing is, it's so exciting because every, we don't do this for money. Like teaching kids is 
so inspiring. I would do, of course, I have bills to pay and stuff, but many times I think like, wow, I can't believe I get to do this work. Mm -hmm. It's such beautiful work and I would do it for free. Don't tell my boss, but (laughs) I mean, it's just like, you know, you walk in and before you know it, it's like, oh my gosh, it's over. Mm -hmm. It went by so fast. And then as far as the art making goes, you know, you're always learning new things about yourself. And so what an exciting life, even if you never sell one darn thing (laughs) or no one ever likes what you're doing or you never get any recognition, who cares? Because Mm -hmm. it's just such a fun thing to be discovering and exploring. Uh. Not everyone gets that privilege or trust in enough in themselves to allow that privilege to happen. Yeah, it does take such trust to let yourself go to town on a blank canvas. Diving into that can be scary. And I've just thought of as you're talking about sort of this like love of teaching and also art making, whether you share your art making with your students at all. I do. Mm-hmm. I actually I have paintings at work and I have like trays that I can put away so the paint won't dry. So I'm always mm-hmm. just, I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble to say <laughs> this, but I think it's professional development that in between my classes, I might just pull out my paint palette mm-hmm. and put some stuff on my painting, work on a layer here. Mm-hmm. And the kids love to see the process and they are really like my cheerleaders. Mm-hmm. We're cheerleaders for each other because they're like, oh my gosh, Miss Merceron, what if you get famous? And I'm like, Miss Merceron, Miss Merceron is probably never going to get famous. <laughs> you might get famous before me, but we're just going to have fun and we're going to enjoy the ride. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that they're cheering you on and they have that vision of like, well, you're an artist. So someday you're going to be, you know, this famous artist in museums. And <laughs> but it's amazing though that you're like, they, they see you that way. And I think that's really important that kids, that students start to see like you're the art teacher and they can see that you're actually also an artist. It's a, it's wonderful. Yeah. Well, I think we have to be right. Mm-hmm. I mean, if we're going to be good, good art teachers, we really should practice our craft. And I think the more art I make, the better I teach because sometimes we can get pigeonholed as teachers and going on Pinterest and I love Pinterest, but like, you know, we are creative beings. Like we can generate ideas. We don't have to always be looking to others. And the more we create, the more ideas are going to come. Like it's like Mm -hmm. the more you exercise, the, the more strong you feel. Yeah. Yeah. It's a muscle. Yeah. Okay. I have a couple of just kind of like fun wrapping up questions. So one really broad, what are you curious about? I'm curious about money. (laughs) So I just, I have been, well, I've been reading lots of different books, but Mm -hmm. just curious about how people learn to make money work for them Mm -hmm. and uh, thinking about ways to just be smarter with money because I I get tired of, you know, the people at the top are the ones that just are rocking and rolling and us middle-class folks just seem to not know all the secrets. So Mm -hmm. trying to find some of these secrets. And that's one thing I'm interested in learning about how to invest in those types of things. Mm, Yeah. And teachers, especially just we don't get paid what we should and we have to end up putting so much. I don't know about you, but I always put so much money into my teaching that's like just out of my pocket. And I know so many teachers do. Okay, well, I have a fun little question. What is your go-to order at your favorite restaurant? 
I love, so there's a little restaurant called Muchachos in Atlanta, and I love their poke bowl. It's mm-hmm. just my favorite thing. It's it's the coolest little restaurant because it's a hodgepodge of things. Like there's some Asian things and there is some uh, like burritos and different things. Mm-hmm. And it's a coffee shop. It's kind of like if I were a restaurant, that's how it would be because I'm all over the place. But yeah, muchachos and the poke bowl. Awesome. That sounds really good. I love poke bowls too. Is there anything else that you would want to add? Yes, I want to add advice for young teachers Mm -hmm. because I I didn't go the traditional route. I have an interior design degree and then I went to grad school for art education. I never did student Mm -hmm. teaching, so I had to kind of learn the hard way. I learned about classroom management after I was put on a one of those whatever that red flag they put when they evaluate you I got that and it oh that was a whole nother journey where I was just every day like oh can I do this I I love to teach I love children I love art like I'm passionate and there's lots of people that aren't even passionate and they're doing this Mm -hmm. and I want to be here and so I was always just thinking like how can I do better how can I do better and then I get this red flag on my Teeks evaluation. That's what they call it in Georgia. But you know what? That made me stronger. And once I got that classroom management under control, everything else just seemed to fall into place. So my advice for new teachers, give yourself grace. Mm -hmm. Be proud of yourself. Celebrate your small wins. Also self-reflect every day. What did you do well? What should you improve? How can you make it better? Be yourself. Laugh. Add humor. If, If you're a funny person, just let your students see a little glimpse of who you are. Mm-hmm. And and don't be afraid to show them that we're not perfect. I think that mm-hmm. they respect us even more when they know that we're just like them. Like we're people. We're not meant to be put on a pedestal. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like that's so helpful for students to see and helpful for you in like building a relationship with them. Yes. Yeah. Is there anybody that you would like to thank? or give like a shout out to? I would like to thank my mom, Audrey Lee. She has always encouraged my art making and she's never said, oh, you know, it's hard to make it as an artist. She's always just said, wow, you're improving. You're doing great. I love she just always lifted me up and and let me know that whatever I decided to do with my life, she was going to be super proud. Uh, yeah, having that bolster, that person who like builds you up is so wonderful and helpful. And kind of last thing, where can our listeners connect with you online? So you can connect with me, uh, laurenmerceron.com is my website. And and my Instagram is Lauren Merceron Art. And my email is Lauren Merceron at gmail.com. Awesome. So I will link to everything. Thank you so much, Lauren. It was so nice to hear your story and hear more about your work and your teaching. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Lauren. That was so inspiring to hear. Next week, I'll be sharing my conversation with Hannah Zimmerman, and then we'll take a little break for the holidays and come back in 2021. I can't believe this year is almost over. Thank you so much for listening. As always, you can reach me at Teaching Artist Podcast on Instagram or teachingartistpodcast at gmail.com. Who do you want to hear from? Please share your recommendations of teaching artists. And if you loved this episode, please subscribe, leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts, and follow me. It really makes a big difference. 
Thank you. Thank you.